So uh, yes, uh, it's about uh, fair data and what we are doing with RTA and the 807 fire. And um, there is a good uh, panel of people that will explain to us all the details. First on fair data, we has then uh, on Alicia with the Fair for Health project, then uh, some tools from Turkey uh, for the Fair for Health about uh, verification, uh, then back to maturity models, and last but not least, what we do with uh, standards. So we have actually a, a small poll question to kick start the um, to kick start. So this is a uh, this is a question about your background. So please answer it uh, to know a little bit more about you. I will leave it for uh, 15 minutes, uh, seconds, yeah. Maybe 20 seconds. Yeah, we have 21 people voting, 22, 23, 24. Four, twenty-five. I think that's good. Um, so here, here are the results. Um, yeah. So mostly from the scientific community, which is good. Stop sharing the results. So I have. Um, yeah. Um, so. Um, so, so yes, uh, what, the, what is our mission here? What are we doing here? Uh, so RDA, the Research Data Alliance and ATL7, a standards organization, cooperate with Fair for Health project, which brings the fair principles into health data sets to promote fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable by using ATL7 standards and specifically ATL7 FIRE. Our goal is to jointly develop tools and guides that enable fairness. And here our objectives today is to help you learn a little bit more. And if we are lucky enough, uh, I get a few more people, a few more hands, a few more minds to make things happen. So that's our objective. And uh, for that, I have a second poll uh, for you, uh, which is about uh, your level of knowledge uh, regarding uh, regarding the use of fair principles. Again, I will leave it for about 30 seconds uh, for you to vote to know how much you know about fair data and uh, verification and fair maturity models twenty four people yeah twenty five okay so I end the polling uh, and here are the results. Uh, so most of you, 16 of you, 59% uh, have a positive idea about uh, the principles of FAIR. Uh, some of you have insufficient knowledge and I hope we can change that. Yeah, so let's start now. Um, so the, our first uh, speaker is Esther. Esther, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, tell us about uh, FAIR data. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Esther Teino. As you have been explained to, I'm a visiting researcher at the University of Leipzig and a PhD student at the University of Medicine, Greifswald. So I'm gonna give an overview of what is FAIR data, which is a general introduction um, to the audience. Next slide, please. So imagine, if your data and your results were recoverable by you or other people who might be interested in it in the future, or if your data was accessible regardless of how you stored it and in the format you stored it in, or if your data and results were interoperable independently of who the author is or where the origin is at, or if your data and results were reusable for further analysis without you having to repeat the experiments. Next slide, please. So in the current situation, you will find that there's a lot of different analog and digital devices that are used to store data and experimental setups and observations are recorded in a handwritten format in a, in a lab notebook. And um, for the most part, this lab notebook is independent from, indi from digital 
or analog sources and then they, these different formats. And then all these different formats are then um, in heterogeneous systems, which are then homogenized. And this is um, a process that takes a lot of time and it is a clerical burden um, for the people who have to homogenize these heterogeneous systems. And then only the owner of these notebooks or of this um, <clears throat> handwritten notes can read and reuse the data within an acceptable time frame. So anybody else who would like to access that data cannot because they are not um, the typical or the actual owner of, of this um, data. Next slide, please. Another thing that we have a lot is that we have um, data being stored on a hard disk or a USB, but more and more people are switching to company cloud servers for data storage. Um, and uh, the thing about these clouds is they tend to um, allow for data sharing and support access authorization within companies, um, but they are not reusable for researcher groups that are external to the company. Next slide, please. So scientific data continues to be generated in exponential quantities. There's a lot of scientific data going um, being generated day after day. And um, this creates exciting opportunities for secondary research or for alternative hypotheses to be developed and tested against existing data. As opposed to regenerating data, we could um, use that same data for um, further analysis and to explore other research questions. But for this to happen, we need to have this data in a format that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Next slide, please. So for the data to be findable, we're talking about that it is easy to find for both humans and machines, and it has a unique and persistent identifier or um, ID that helps humans and machines to find it in an appropriate way. It has metadata that is rich and, it, and the metadata then allows anybody to use the data for any purpose or to find the data for any purpose. And um, it, the globally unique and persistent ID directly connects the metadata and the data sets. And the results, um, this results in defined uh, standards for data, metadata, and um, association of data and metadata on different data levels. Next slide. Next slide, please. For the data to be accessible, um, we mean that there, the authentication and authorization access has to be known. And there are special tools or communication methods um, to define who can access the data and who can reuse the data. And the metadata and the condition under which the associated data are accessible is open and free. And that means that even if the data is heavily protected, it can still be free um, because the metadata is open. And the licensing status becomes more important with automated searches by machines and the conditions under which the data can be used are clear to machines and to humans. Next slide, please. So when we say interoperable, we are talking about different machines being able to use the data um, in spite of their differences. And this is made possible through controlled vocabularies or ontologies that describe data sets. And um, the vocabularies or ontologies need to be well documented and clearly defined. Comprehensive information about analysis, storage, and processing is important for interpretation and, and um, knowledge representation. Um, this is extremely important because we need to enrich the knowledge about the data and to create as many meaningful links as possible between data sets and machines. Next up. Next slide, please. So for it to be reusable, we are talking about information at all the data levels is made available because the data publisher does not know what the reuser's needs are. So basically you publish your data 
or you present your data in a format that assumes that the next person who's going to use it, you don't know who it is, but you're trying to make it as reusable for whoever the next person will be. We call this the next person, um, the data consumer or the reuser. And so the reuser, for, for you as a reuser to reuse this data, you need to know where the data came from, who to cite, how to cite, and how the owner wanted to be confirmed. And this is possible um, if the, it's only possible to reuse data sets if they are similar. That means that they're the same type of data, they're organized in a standardized way, and they're well-established and sustainable file formats. And the metadata and all documentation following a common template and using common vocabulary. Community standards or best practices are important in, in the reusability of data because for the most part, um, data is specific to domain. The uptake of data principles, um, or, or rather the fair data principles. So after the fair data principles has shown um, improved data stewardship, after the implementation of the fair data principles, there has been shown improved data stewardship um, as a result of adherence to the principles. And so now the fair data principles is frequently expected by researchers and publishers and funding agencies and policymakers, such as the Health Research Board in Ireland and um, the equivalent body in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. So there's a success story I'd like to share. Uh, the Harmony Big Data Project, which has verified data from over 45,000 blood cancer patients across Europe. And the Harmony uses this data to quantify the clinical outcomes of particular treatments and decide on the best standards so that they may be implemented right across Europe. So that means if you're in Italy, if you're in Germany, if you're in Spain, you will still get um, a standardized uh, standardized care because um, the data has been verified and the verified data is used to um, inform decisions uh, that are critical to your care. And this approach is beneficial to policymakers, financials, healthcare providers, and especially to the patients. Next slide, please. Those are my contact details. Um, if you have questions, if you would like to collaborate, um, please feel free to hit me up. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Esther. Let's uh, move uh, to Alicia then and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, the Fair for Health uh, project. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. Now I'm going to introduce the main aspect of Fair for Health projects. Next slide, please. This European project was funded by the European Commission through the topic encouraging the reuse of research data generated by publicly funded research projects. Fair for Health started on December 2018, is going to finish on November 2021, and it is coordinated by Virgen del Rocío University Hospital as part of the Andalusian Health Service in Spain. The main researcher is Carlos, Carlos Luis Parra Calderón. The consortium accounts for 17 partners from 11 European and non-European countries with expertise from different domains, health research, data managers, medical informatics, software developers, and so on. Researchers from the Andalusian Health Service from Health Level 7 from the Institute for Medical Informatics, Statistics and Epidemiology from Leipzig and from Software Research and Development Consultancy are authors of this tutorial. Next slide, please. In these 22 months, the consortium has performed a lot of necessary relationships. By one hand, with the Research Data Alliance, we collaborate with some RDA interest and working groups. Researchers from the RDA Reproducible Health Data Services Working Group are authors of this tutorial too. In the context of this project, we are working very hard in a new RDA working group on raising fairness in health data and health research performing organizations. Currently, 
this working group is formally created and the chairs are from Fer the Fair for Health projects, Celia Alvarez from the Andalusian Health Service from Spain and Chamuga Sudaram Benkataraman from the University of Edinburgh from the United Kingdom. Kristan Kang from the Australian Research Data Commons from Australia and Anupama Gururaj from the National Institute of Health from the United States of America. The official presentation of this new working group will be carried out next 12th November in the next RDA's 16th plenary. I would like to take advantage of the opportunity to encourage the audience to join this working group on the RDA website. <clears throat> By other hand, we have established relationships too with the European Open Science Cloud through the GoFair initiative, that is a bottom-up stakeholder driving and self-governed initiative that aims to implement the fair data principles and the EOS Life projects, especially participating in the working group called Turn Turning Fair into Reality. Furthermore, we are in contact with other European projects as Fair is Fair and Fair Plus. Next slide, please. The overall objective of Fair for Health is to facilitate and encourage the European Union health research community to verify, share, and reuse their, their data sets derived from public funded research initiatives. The specific objective number one covers the design and implementation of an effective outreach strategy. The second specific objective proposes to produce a set of guidelines to inform a number of RDA recommendations in order to set a fair data certification roadmap. The third one aims to develop and validate technological tools to enable the translation from raw data to fair data. And finally, the fourth specific objective states to demonstrate the potential impact that the implementation of such fair data strategy will have in terms of health outcome and health research through the development and validation of two case studies. Next slide, please. The first case study will address the discovery of disease onset triggers and disease association patterns in comorbid patients. And the second one will address an innovative prediction service for 30 days readmission risk in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Next slide, please. In Fair for Health project, recently we have launched the Fair for Health Open Community Memberships. I would like to take advantage of the opportunity to encourage the audience to, to join this open community. To get registered as a Fair for Health Open Community member, please go to Fair for Health website and select the upper option Membership and click the Register Now button. This membership has a lot of benefits to members allowing take part in the hands of the collaborative use of fair for health tools and workflows, facilitating the reuse of the fair for health source code published on GitHub to make your own platform that can be tailored to their own use and purpose, and offering priority in receiving all public dissemination material generated in the context of the projects. Next slide, please. To address the translation from raw data into FAIR data, we have defined the FAIR for Health verification process. GoFAIR defined a verification process without considering specific requirements that may arise when dealing with some particular types of data, in our case, health data. By, based on this verification process, we created our verification process ten, taking into account technical barriers, ethical impl implications, and the legal framework. Uh, in the diagram, the blue steps are based on GoFair process, and the green step has been defined by Fair for Health projects. The raw data, 
no, uh, previous slide, please. The raw data to the conferred data is going to be analyzed, curate, validate, and anonymize. The data is modeled semantically and make linkable. The license version and index are attributed. So metadata is aggregated, it proceeds, and finally the data go under the process of making it publishable. If the raw data go, goes under this process, we are going to obtain fair data. Next slide, please. The technological solution that we are developing is based on two main entities, the fair for Health platform on the left and the fair for Health local agents on the right in the diagram. The fair for Health agents which will be located at, at the data owner's premises will enable the verification of local data sets through its user driving extraction transformation and load functionalities. At the end of the verification workflows, the data sets will be normalized, curated and made to domain vocabularies and ontology, acting like data fair ports. The agents are going to execute data mining services to be run locally with the need of hosting these data sets outside the owner's premises. The Fair for Health platform will act as the facilitator for deploying and delivering innovative data driven services to the Fair for Health community by hosting the repository of actionable data mining models that could be executed on real time. The Fair for Health platform will act as a half of the federated agents. This technological solution uses Health Level 7 FIRE standard and its development is in alignment with the EOS initiative, making an essential contribution to the definition of metadata to achieve interoperability Offer for health, offer health reserve digital objects available in the EOS interoperability framework. That's all for my side. Thank you very much for the attention. Below, Anil Sinas is going to continue reviewing the main aspects of the tool developed until now in the project for verifying medical data. Thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, Greetings from Seville, and uh, now we move to Ankara, Turkey, for uh, for the tools for verification. Merk and Anil, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. This is Anil speaking. Uh, I am technically uh, leading the design and development of the software uh, that we are doing to support this uh, verification workflow just mentioned by my colleague Alicia. So uh, together with my co colleague Mert, we are going to uh, introduce you to the tools and the design and how we implement this pro verification workflow in our project. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, in, on, on, in our architecture, uh, what we try to do is actually to completely cover the verification workflow steps uh, that mentioned by Alicia, the, you, you remember the blue, blue and uh, yellow colored boxes, the steps. And we based our design uh, on uh, HS7 FIRE standard. So uh, we, we, we utilize an HS7 FIRE standard, uh, FIRE repository, and build uh, supporting software around uh, this uh, standard repository. Uh, as, the FIRE, as a FIRE repository, we use uh, actually our own repository, which is also an open source FIRE repository uh, called OnFIRE. Uh, you can see uh, it's a source code on GitHub available. And uh, we know that uh, since uh, FIRE inherently provides support for, the, uh, for, for some of the verification steps like uh, data versioning, making data linkable, metadata aggregation and publishing, this is already uh, inherently included in the FIRE standard. So uh, by just using the FIRE repository, uh, we are providing this support for the verification workflow. And on top of this, uh, by using on fire, we have extra features like indexing and search uh, capabilities in distributed environments. So, uh, no, previous slide, please. Yes, indexing and search. And also uh, to, to meet all, this, all the, all the uh, surrounding software on a common data model, we, we utilize fire profiling. And again, the profiles that we are developing are open source and available on GitHub. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, 
around the on fire repository, uh, we we developed two standalone desktop applications. The one is called data curation tool and specifically designed for the data curation and validation step. Uh, it's available again on GitHub, and we also have a video tutorial of it. You can you can see uh, this presentation and uh, explore afterwards. The second one is a data privacy tool, specifically designed for the data de-identification and anonymization step. These are standalone desktop applications, so you can download and run on your Windows, Linux, or macOS operating systems. Uh, the, the, the design technology is uh, is Electron JS, and only it's the the only runtime environment required is uh, JavaScript Node.js uh, platform. So uh, we kind of invite you to uh, explore and look how what we develop uh, in in Fair for Health. You can visit our GitHub uh, page uh, on uh, to to see other also other uh, software uh, repositories that we are working on. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a schematic representation of our design and what, what we are developing. At the center of each, let's say, data data center or data owner, uh, we uh, we deploy a fire on fire repository uh, together with Fair for Health common data mode Fair for Health profiles. So uh, we we provide versioning, data versioning, indexing, and search and data provenance. By using utilizing fire and on fire repository, and uh, the data curation tool uh, 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 can read your raw data from uh, my 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 colleague Matthew present from files or databases and map these data to uh, the fire resources, and the conversion is then automatically performed behind the scenes. And data privacy tool uh, just works on a fire repository. And uh, reads and reads your resources, apply your the identification and anonymization configuration, and writes back the secured resources into your fire repository. Next slide, please. So now I leave the floor to my colleague Matt. Uh, I may come in again uh, with with the questions if you have. Uh, Thank you, Anil. Uh, this is Matt speaking. Uh, now I will present uh, the, to, uh, the, two, uh, the two tools, uh, data creation tool and data validation tool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the first uh, screen of uh, data creation tool. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, need, we need to first provide a, a fire repository URL because uh, we, the tool will uh, convert the raw data uh, and uh, write to a fire repository. So in here, we provide the URL of it, and, and then we verify, and then we click the next button. Next, please. And then uh, we, we have to provide our uh, raw data. Uh, we have two options in here. Uh, the raw data can be in a file, for example, an Excel or CSV or it can be a, in a database, for example, PostgreSQL. Uh, in this example, uh, we will uh, provide our data through, through some Excel files. So I click on the Browse button uh, on the left side and then uh, provide my data. Next slide, please. As you can see, uh, I have provided seven files, uh, each for, for example, uh, condition, encounter, medication, patient, uh, et cetera. After I provided this data, again, I click on next uh, to, uh, to uh, write some uh, mappings. Next, please. So uh, this is the uh, main part of uh, what we do in the data creation tool. Uh, if we go from left to right, on the left-hand side, you see the fire resources. So uh, while defining the mappings, first, I need to select the fire resource type. For example, I selected the patient. And then uh, in the second box, uh, I select an existing uh, fire profile, uh, which corresponds to our common data model. After that, on the right-hand side, uh, I select the corresponding uh, source file. Uh, since I am mapping the patient uh, resource now, I select the patient demo uh, Excel file. And then I select the corresponding sheet. So uh, after I uh, selected all of these information, uh, now I will start the uh, mapping process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as an example, for example, I am mapping the gender attribute. 
So on the left hand side, uh, I selected the gender field of uh, fire. And then on the right hand side, I say that, okay, gender corresponds to the gender column in my Excel file. After selecting these two boxes, I select the mesh button. This is a uh, right bottom part of the screen uh, marked as three. And then I mesh the resource. And I, I, I will do all of this uh, for uh, all the required fields in the profile. For example, the patient ID, uh, for example, the birth date, uh, the country or more. So uh, in this screen, uh, you see that okay, I, uh, I mapped all my uh, information and I have another option uh, marked as uh, two in the screen. Uh, it is the concept map. So the idea is, for example, in my profile, uh, I define some uh, concept maps, uh, for example, uh, uh, terminology standards. But uh, my, my uh, own data is uh, written in proprietary data format. So uh, I click on this button, uh, next slide please. And then uh, I select the uh, source and target formats and the tool in the background uh, converts the, uh, uh, performs the terminology mapping so that uh, all the data will be converted to, uh, to fire uh, in, the, uh, in conformance to the uh, profile. So next slide, please. Uh, when I scroll down, uh, these are all the mappings defined, for example, for condition, for encounter, uh, for medication, for patient. After I define all my uh, mappings, uh, now it is time to uh, convert the raw data to HL7 fire. Next slide, please. Uh, so in here, uh, I, I, I clicked on the transform button and uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, uh, the, the red box numbered one, uh, all of them are completed. And in the, in the box uh, marked, uh, marked as two, uh, you see the successful uh, count. So uh, I had, for example, uh, if, if you look at the uh, last one, this is the patient. Uh, there were uh, 732 uh, raw patient data, and all of them have converted to HL7 file format successfully. And I can see the details by click on the uh, details button. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is an example output of data creation tool uh, as a result of a fire query. Uh, as you can see uh, in the Fifth row, uh, the total number of patients are uh, 732. And uh, for example, if you look at the line number uh, 39, uh, the gender is written as male. Uh, line number 40, the birth date is here. Or line number uh, 43, uh, the country is uh, written as uh, Netherlands. So uh, this part finishes the data creation tool. Now the next part will be to perform uh, the, the anonymization and uh, anonymization and the identification uh, by using the data privacy tool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the tool has a similar uh, user uh, interface uh, like the data creation tool. Uh, so the idea of data privacy tool is to fetch uh, data from a file repository and uh, perform some uh, the identification uh, algorithms uh, on the fire data and write back this data uh, in, uh, in a uh, privacy uh, conserving uh, way. So again, I provide the fire URL and I click on next. And uh, I, I select the fire resource. Uh, since our example is, was on patient, uh, in here uh, I, I, am, I continue with the patient data. Uh, I select the patient fire resource and I select the patient uh, profile in here. And then the next step is uh, to select the attribute types. Uh, so uh, an uh, for an attribute, I have four options. It can be an identifier, uh, meaning that uh, uh, it is an it is a uh, identifier uh, information uh, for the patient. It can be a quasi identifier, uh, which means that uh, by uh, by itself it does not identify patient, but uh, by uh, using, for example, let's say four or five quasi identifiers, I can identify the patient. Uh, or it can be a sensitive attribute. Uh, for example, it can be a, a rare condition, uh, which is sensitive, uh, like HIV, for example. Or it can be insensitive, uh, meaning that uh, there is nothing, uh, there is no need to do uh, any uh, de identification or anonymization operation on it. Next slide, please. So uh, with this information, I start uh, using the tool. Uh, for example, uh, for the gender attribute, uh, the, the, the box number two, uh, for the gender attribute, I selected quasi-identifier. Uh, for birth date attribute, I select uh, a, a quasi-identifier. Uh, 
uh, or uh, for the uh, for the first part uh, for the telecom attribute uh, i select value as uh, identifier uh, next slide please and after i select this information now it is time to configure the algorithms so uh, the tool uh, allows users to select uh, several uh, select an algorithm from several options uh, so uh, now i will first deal with the quasi identifiers and in the second box uh, there are there are the options uh, next slide please uh, for example that uh, here here are the possible options uh, we have the pastry information meaning that uh, we we save the data with no change uh, substitution for example uh, it it makes uh, it substitute the character in it for example uh, fuzzing uh, in fuzzing we add a noise to the data uh, or reduction for example uh, we, which which completely removes the data uh, so uh, with this in mind uh, i decide uh, how to uh, how to uh, de-identify my data next slide please so uh, i selected my uh, possible algorithms and the next option is to uh, select from uh, k anonymity attribute uh, and in here uh, i i have several options two three or five uh, next slide please and the, the final step of uh, the identification is uh, to deal with a sensitive attribute so in here uh, i have the setting uh, button next please uh, for example, for the rare values, uh, for uh, for example, the, for the marital status, uh, I can replace, uh, let's say, legally separated attribute uh, to unmarried uh, to uh, generalize it a bit uh, because uh, this is a sensitive attribute for me and I don't want anyone to see a legally separated value. Uh, I define this one in here. Next, please. And uh, uh, finally, I click on the de-identify button uh, so that uh, my data will be de-identified. Uh, next, please. And uh, in here, uh, you see that uh, the data of the, the, the de-identification operation is successful and uh, the final resource count are written in there. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see a, a field named restricted resource count. Uh, this means that uh, in order to satisfy the K anonymity, uh, the, tool, uh, the tool can restrict uh, some of the resources. And in this example, 19 of them are restricted. Next, please. So this is the output of a data privacy tool. Uh, for example, if you look at the fifth column, there are again uh, 732 patients in here. In, uh, in this one, uh, if you look at the column number 32, uh, there is a new meta tag in, on the data, which is security. And it is, uh, it is tagged as a low risk because after the de-identification process, uh, this, this data is, uh, has a low risk to uh, identify the patient. If you look at the uh, 46th uh, row, Gender is uh, written as male because I selected pastoral, which means that do not change the data and directly write it. But for the birth date, you see that uh, there is no uh, month or day field, only the year field, because I generalized it uh, in this way. And I said that only keep the uh, year information. Uh, next, please. So uh, these were the uh, demonstration of the tools. Uh, now, finally, uh, I would like to talk about the privacy preserving distributed data mining part. Uh, so in the project, uh, as Alicia presented, uh, we have several agents in uh, several countries. So uh, for example, on the left-hand side, you see that uh, SAS and YAX are uh, two, two partners in the project, and uh, these are uh, their architecture. And uh, after we changed, after we, uh, we verified the data, uh, we perform some data mining operations on it, and we do it without, uh, without, uh, without uh, moving any data to uh, any third party application. So there are some agents uh, on, uh, on, the, on these uh, partners' uh, premises, and we train some machine learning models uh, on, this, uh, on this architecture, and then we move only the trained model and we uh, we generate a boosted model uh, out of these uh, weak models. So uh, this is the this is the final part of my presentation. Uh, now we we have some uh, we have two uh, poll questions in here, uh, and uh, we invite you to uh, have a look at these questions. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, 
please respond to our first question, which is about privacy preserving uh, data mining. Tell us uh, what you think. Should uh, verified data be accessible to um, privacy preserved data mining algorithms, distributed data mining algorithms? Okay, uh, we have 23 out of 39, so please respond if you are not uh, done. 25, couple of more. Okay, I'm ending the poll. Uh, uh, here are the results. Uh, most of you strongly agree, but there is a, actually most of you are neutral to that, so you haven't formed your opinion. So let me uh, let me go to our second question that has to do with uh, privacy preserving. Uh, distributed data mining. So, what would you share if you were to share something? Would you share the data sets or would you share the models? I mean, somebody might want to share both. Maybe we should actually... Ah. Okay. There are differences, most of people say, <coughs> between sharing the models and sharing the data. This is interesting, yeah, sharing the algorithms. Okay, so let's end the poll. And here are the results. Most of you uh, think that there is indeed a, result, a difference between sharing the data sets and sharing the, the models. And that means that you did a very good job in, uh, in the showing uh, uh, the algorithms and the approach that Fair for Health is doing. Uh, meanwhile, we have a question that maybe you would like to answer, one of you. Uh, which physiological signal data format does the curation tool support, if any? Yeah, I, I'm going to answer it. Yes, please. Uh, I, I was writing, by the way. Do you want me to speak? Catherine? I mean, answer it live, yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, you know, which physiological signal data form is that <coughs> the curation tool support? It's it's, it currently can read uh, from uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets and uh, comma separated values in text format and uh, can access to relational SQL databases, uh, but it's not uh, fully functional yet. Okay, I suspect that this question uh, talks about like blood pressure data or, or this kind of question. Um, Ah, yeah. well, actually, it doesn't make a difference for the tool. Mm. Uh, so, so the type of the data doesn't make a difference for the tool. So because okay. uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I think you answered. Thank you very much for the response. Uh, let's uh, move to the next question. I'm conscious also of the time. As usual, we are. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to RDA and Oya Bayan from Fraunhofer, who will uh, talk to us uh, about the uh, uh, frameworks uh, for how do we measure fairness. Oya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, yeah, uh, in this tutorial, Esther nicely presented uh, what is the FAIR data. Then Alicia, Mert, and Anil uh, show the different implementation uh, methods and uh, tools. Now my question is, how can I evaluate the fairness level of data? And what are the existing metrics, methods to measure the compliance of the FAIR principles? Next. Maybe first we should uh, talk about why do we need to evaluate and what is the benefit of this evaluation? 
Uh, if you think about the fair data and fair principles, they are very nice guidelines, but implementing them is not always very easy and straightforward. You have to go through the uh, lots of hurdles, uh, finding the community standards, building it, implementing it, aligning your technical architecture uh, with uh, fair requirements. And also there are cultural change, uh, cultural requirements to change the culture of data sharing. Therefore, like a uh, first thing maybe to do to understand your current status. What is your level of fairness uh, with your uh, existing community standards in your project, which requirements you already fulfill? And what could be the uh, things that you can change and improve so you can set a roadmap for yourself, a targeted level of uh, fairness? Assessment tools and maturity levels helps you to uh, lay out those steps and uh, create this roadmap. Then when you are using this assessment methods, you can also benchmark your outcomes with others. Next, please. Uh, when uh, we are uh, starting the, uh, this uh, assessment uh, models, uh, one of the challenge was fair principles are not very strict. This is uh, intentionally because they want to cover uh, lots of communities and lots of uh, implement, uh, lots of interpretations. Uh, what we, uh, what is needed actually uh, remove this ambiguity and uh, deal with this wide ranges of uh, in, uh, interpretations. For example, when you say that uh, data described with uh, rich metadata, it might uh, have different interpretations. If you have, for example, uh, keywords about your data set, this is data set about cardiovascular diseases, then uh, do you satisfy this uh, metric? Or if you, uh, do you need more metadata about different phenotypes? Or uh, do you need how this is a single measurement has been made, such as blood pressure taken when patients are standing or sitting. So these are all different implementations. And as a result, uh, different fair assessment frameworks appeared. Uh, consequence was we had different metrics and we, we cannot compare the outcomes. Then we need to bring all these uh, different uh, methods together and uh, create a community uh, standard and community understanding. Yeah, next slide, please. Here the RD uh, Research Data Alliance uh, comes into uh, place. Before I talk about the RD, I would like to take a poll and see if you are familiar with RD. Uh, do, do you are you familiar with RDA recommendations? Are you participating? Uh, any interest or working group? Uh, yeah, please uh, answer the poll so I can understand your familiarity about RDA. Uh, 20 people have answered. Maybe some more of you would like to give us your input. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll stop the poll now. We have 23 answers, uh, more than half. And we see that we have three people in the audience that are part of an RDA uh, working group. Uh, here are the results. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, most of the people would like to learn more about available recommendations and outputs. Good. So then I can a little bit talk about the existing recommendations uh, for uh, FAIR data. First, maybe about RDA. RDA is uh, established in uh, 2013 uh, by a European Commission, Commission U uh, US National Science Foundation and Australian Government Department of Innovation. And uh, this, its main aim
aim to promote open uh, science data sharing and uh, data reuse across the domains. Next slide, please. Currently, like in less than 10 years uh, in RDA, we have almost 11,000 uh, members from uh, 137 different countries uh, between different academic fields. And uh, there are uh, almost 100 different groups working on uh, recommendations about how to uh, make this uh, data shareable, how to remove te uh, technological and social barriers around data sharing. RD is an open community. It uh, like uh, becoming a member doesn't require uh, any uh, membership fee. And anyone interested can become member by going to website and can join uh, working groups on their domains and, and interest areas. So I would like you to encourage to go and explore health related uh, working groups. We have more than 10 uh, health related working groups currently, and they are uh, doing great work on uh, publishing recommendations. Next slide, please. In this talk, I will focus on one specific group on fair data maturity working group. The aim of this working group is, uh, is to remove the ambiguity around uh, measurement of uh, fair principles and uh, come up with a core criteria uh, for this uh, uh, assessment metrics. This working group worked uh, for one and a half years uh, with contribution of uh, multiple uh, disciplines and a uh, list uh, for uh, indicators for assessing uh, compliance to fair principles uh, and uh, explore different evaluation methods. Group's aim was to uh, create a common understanding on these indicators. Next slide, please. In here, you see an overview, uh, like we have 42 uh, indicators uh, and uh, a final report on different, uh, on four different uh, FAIR principles. Those indicators expand uh, in these FAIR principles. For example, uh, when we have the principle of metadata and data uh, is identified by, glo by globally unique persistent identifier, they uh, divide this, this into measurable parts and provide some guidance about how to evaluate a specific uh, principle. Next slide, please. In here, you uh, see an example indicator. Each indicator has identifier. Uh, it refers to certain principle. It provides a description and also assessment details on how we're gonna assess it. For example, in here, how you can measure the global uniqueness and there are recommendations on using uh, registry services such as uh, fair sharing. Next slide, please. We, uh, for the, uh, as I said, RD is open to uh, all communities and different communities has different prioritization and different goals uh, uh, for implementing uh, fair principles. Therefore, like uh, there were different opinions about these prioritizations and uh, RDA tried to come up with a common consensus on uh, those uh, priorities, which part of the FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable, is more important for uh, different research communities. And in here, I would like to ask your opinion. Uh, what do you think, uh, which uh, FAIR uh, letter is more important for the health data sets? Are we looking for findability or accessing to this uh, data sets, uh, interoperability, or reusing in different contexts?
we have some results already or yes let's have some more answers 24 people answered maybe yeah. some more please thought 25 okay so i end the poll here and here are the results okay yeah most of the people uh, think all of uh, uh, all of them uh, is important but if you look the individual ones interoperability is uh, more prominent uh, on uh, compared to other principles. If you look to RDA uh, prioritization, you will see the other way around. Uh, uh, in here, uh, mandatory ones are unfindable and accessible, and you will only see very limited uh, indicators mandatory for the interoperable. This shows the difference between this perception of different domains and are they also encourage different domain areas to set their own prioritizations? Next slide, please. Once we have the uh, indicators, we can use the different evaluation methods, such as uh, like you can compare this uh, data sets and say this data sets pass or fails, or you can compare the progress towards the fairness, how I can improve certain indicator by stepwise. So this is the area each uh, domain should explore. And uh, uh, next slide, please. I would like to give an example of a project uh, working on uh, enhancing this RDA model for uh, RDA maturity model for a specific uh, domain, which is the life sciences. In uh, FAIR Plus project, uh, aims to develop tools and guidelines for the life sciences, uh, similar to FAIR for health project, but in the life sciences domain. And uh, this project, uh, in this project, we develop a capability maturity model framework for life sciences, for assessing fairness uh, level of data for the specific needs of that life sciences domain. Next slide, please. What uh, uh, FAIR Plus project is uh, looking for, an assessment tool for comparing uh, the benefits and costs of the verification. Uh, the, in this project, we do not target always the highest levels of fairness, but what is the optimum level of fairness uh, when we are looking our business goals, our domain requirements, and what are the capabilities needs to be supported uh, in this uh, fair uh, implementation. Next slide, please. Therefore, like uh, in this project, we are uh, uh, taking this RD indicators as a core and looking at these different uh, domain requirements, such as data interpretability. Data integration is an important topic for uh, uh, life sciences, data repurposing or reproducibility. For each of these fields, uh, we uh, have a certain benefits, for example, data integration, reduced time spent for data, and uh, data reproducibility makes using, uh, attaining same results by different teams. And for each of them, you need different types of metadata. Uh, for one, you need vocabularies on ontologies, and for reproducibility, you need uh, study design and measuring tools. So, uh, this is the model for extending RDA indicators. You can find more information on FAIR plus GitHub. Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, what we should be doing actually in health domain too, we should look for the uh, similar uh, model for uh, exploring benefits of fair data in healthcare and uh, like how we can uh, build a maturity models by using existing standards, by leveraging existing standards and extending for the specific needs of fair data. In here, I will uh, give the floor to Georgia. We'll talk about fair uh, for fire. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Katarina, could you move the next one? Thank you. Next one. So, uh, where this new project come from? Uh, 
as introduced in the Fair for Health project, we have evaluated if and how this HL7 fire standard could support the data verification. And what we have recognized is that this standard could be an enabling factor for the data fairness. Next one. With uh, having this in mind, uh, no, I don't think there is the, uh, the pool, Catherine. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with this in mind, in July last year, uh, we had a webinar in, the, uh, in May uh, in which we have uh, under, discussed and tried to discuss how Airbnb and HL7 could cooperate to promote the data fairness through the HL7 standard. And the result of this uh, webinar has been, the slide, uh, has been uh, the uh, uh, creation of a new, next slide please, uh, the creation of a new um, proposal for HL7 with intent to develop an HL7 uh, fire implementation guide to provide guidance on how the standard can be used to uh, facilitate the implementation and the assessment of fair health data. Next slide. The intent of that project is to facilitate also the collaboration between the HL7 FIRE and FDA community in, in that purpose. We have mentioned several times FIRE, so I really would like to uh, hear from you how much do you know about that standard? Okay, do we have the result? Let's wait a little bit longer. A few more answers to get uh, like 70%. Uh, uh, we are at 60% now. That's all, all right. Uh, So let's see. Okay, so here are the results. Okay, curious to read more, but there are several people. Uh, okay, it seems that the level of knowledge is quite good. So next slide, maybe we can avoid it to uh, this. Next slide. Next. Uh, I, assume, I assume that uh, all of you knows what is HL7. Next, next. We can maybe skip that part and gain some time for the final discussion. Uh, next slide. Uh, I assume that you know that FIRE is a new generation standard for uh, uh, in HL7 that use uh, the component of core resource. And the good thing is that HL7 FIRE is not only a technical standard, but it's mainly a community of people. So uh, next slide. Uh, the, the purpose of this project is to create an implementation guide, but what is, is an implementation guide in FIRE? It defines a set of rules that describe how the FIRE resources can be used for a specific purpose, and with the documentation that explain how to, how to uh, make this usage of the standard. Usually it has a web uh, human readable part, and also a set of formal computable resources that can be used for assessing the conformance of the instances against that guide. And this is what we would like to do also with that project. Next slide. So the, as described above, uh, the intent is to provide a guidance on how FIRE can be used for supporting implementation and the assessment of, uh, of fair health data. Next slide. And with the goal, uh, the goal uh, to suggest an assessment methodology, exploring machine readable and manual assessment method, and also to identify how the standard can support and fulfill the fairness methodology indicator. Next slide. 
and this is supposed to be done uh, analyzing how the fire, fire data conceptual component can map into the fire resources, uh, how the obviously how the fire resources can support the material indicator and the reproducible health data services. Try to identify minimal data set, minimum metadata that can uh, be used for uh, supporting this uh, maturity indicator. Next slide. But there are also other objectives. It's also to try to facilitate the collaboration between the fire and fire community, enable this cooperative usage of the two paradigm, also providing some cross-model mapping, and as I told described before, support the fairness assessment. Next slide. To achieve that, this result, uh, the idea is to build this implementation guide with a large informative guidance. Uh, and let's say the true FireG means the so, a set of conformal resources and example that for specific cases can describe how the fairness could be assessed. Where we are in next slide, where we are in terms of uh, planning. Uh, the project proposal has been approved. Uh, we have a sponsor working group, fire management group approved. We are waiting for the final uh, SD steering division and PSC approval. Uh, the intent, this is a very challenging uh, deadline. The intent is to have the ballot next May, uh, the STU, the standard for trial use ballot. But what is important is we would like also to promote a fair track at the next fire connectathon starting from January next year. Next slide. So uh, as you can imagine, we have just started this, that journey. Next slide. Uh, we have a lot of questions that need to be addressed that they can be discussed also later on all together. Next slide. But for that reason, is the, the right time to join the group. And if you would like to have, next slide, to have more information about the uh, how to, to learn more about the project or to get involved or also to better understand what does it mean to, uh, to participate to a fire connectathon. Next slide. You can, uh, you, uh, you have a conference page for the project that will be kept updated about the progresses of that uh, HL7 project. There is already a GitHub repository with the source for that implementation guide, and you can follow day by day the, the uh, development of that guide from the build.fire.org uh, site. Next slide. Uh, if you want to, uh, learn more about the how to get involved or to how to participate to the fire connectathon. Let's talk about it uh, later on, or you can contact your HL7 affiliate or your RDA chapter or write to the SOA working group that is the sponsor of that HL7 report. So, thank you so much, and uh, really, uh, we heard to heard from you your opinion and answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Giorgio. I think that uh, we can open the floor for questions, but before that, we have a last uh, poll for the audience. Uh, actually, we have two polls for the, the audience. The, this is the first one. Uh, what kind of health data standards uh, you're familiar with? Um, or you have uh, heard about. Okay, I end the poll now and here are the results. Lots of you know about SNOMED and HL7 Fire. So those are the top ones followed by CDA and LOINC quite interesting as a, as a result. Thank you. And the second uh, question that we would like to ask you before we go has to do about uh, FAIR data. Do you think we did a good job of uh, 
um, telling you about the FAIR data and what's your opinion about the FAIR principles? Uh, so here are the results. Uh, I think we did a fairly good uh, job, uh, given that uh, uh, there are some of you that need to know more, but most of you actually um, are familiar now. Okay, so now I would uh, like to open the floor for questions and, and, uh, and your views. Uh, we actually had a couple of questions for you and, uh, and also to discuss how, how maybe we can all open our cameras now. The ones that are there. Yeah, uh, so we had a couple of questions regarding uh, how uh, how this uh, proceeds or, or if you if you feel that there are certain elements that need to be reflected in FAIR. Uh, that was actually my first uh, question for the people uh, on the panel and also uh, people among the audience. So what are your priorities? Uh, somewhere, uh, actually, let me show the slide here. We had a very, uh, sorry, takes time to go back. Yes. So I, I was inspired actually about the first question and, and we, we saw some really good tools that uh, you developed. And, uh, and I wonder you as developers that have done the work, what do you think are the priorities? What, where would you start in terms of profiles that need uh, to be mandatory for fairness? Maybe Merck or Anil could take this. I don't know if if I can uh, intervene, waiting for some additional input from Merton and Neil, but uh, I would like to maybe uh, to ask to the audience uh, what are the kind of information, the kind of data that you suppose should be initially shared. Do you think that are, for example, the physiological data as in the question before, the type of information or information about condition? or observation the the first that we need to look at or there are other that you think will be relevant in the initial phase of this verification of data and this obviously will reflect uh, the uh, the type of fire profile that we need to start with but i would like to hear the audience what they think we need to focus on in this initial phase Uh, we have actually a question from the audience in regards to that, uh, Giorgio. Uh, it reads as follows. Regarding physiological signal data formats, there are a number of researchers who are interested in exchanging physiological signal data. There are many formats. I'm not uh, endorsing CDF, but this paper introduced you to this area and it has the link. So maybe I can take a little bit from here and uh talk about this uh, many pro formats problem. It's very common in life sciences domain too. So like when you are working on an uh, area, then you ha might have two different problems. Either you don't have any common uh, uh, standard or format, or you might have many of them. So what is probably important for uh, when you are sharing the data, uh, being able to refer those formats and standards and registries become very important. When you are working on higher uh, profiles, uh, the standards you applied or refer referred in fire profiles should be registered and should be referenceable. Uh, 
so it, maybe it's first step towards uh, resolving and uh, moving towards a kind of common understanding and converging to a single standard using re registries. So, so for instance, what is the case with the GDF uh, format that was mentioned by the speaker, by the, the audience here? Is this uh, something that uh, could actually be conveyed by HL7 Fire? Do you think that this could be a possible measure of fairness? Uh, yeah, I am not familiar with that specific standard, but uh, if the standard is uh, published in a registry and like have a nice description and people following that, if they were able to say, okay, I'm following this standard with that version, then uh, it will be a measure of fairness and it will be comply with that uh, metrics. But uh, if we cannot refer that standard explicitly, uh, people don't know uh, what we are following as a standard. So like documenting our practices, uh, documenting that standards that, that we use is very important and we should document them in a machine actionable way, not only on a PDF paper, but in a uh, resolvable uh, URL so you can find all the information about that standard. So I think that's the one thing maybe we can work on making these standards visible through the registries. Hmm. Yes, indeed. And if we recall the answer of Anil earlier when he was asked about the formats that are used, he mentioned that he is using essentially data structure neutral formats uh, like um, uh, like comma separated values or, or Excel. Uh, Giorgio, last question. How is uh, this project? Uh, you are the leader of this project. How are you going to uh, think about uh, this approach going, you know, from Excel style formats into actual fire profiles. Do you have any initial views on the subject? I mean that uh, obviously the, the scope of that project is not to, to convert from one format to the other, but to define a set of conformance resources in fire to represent in fire this information. It's clear that if you would like to support the data fairness, it's important to be able, because the reality is to have different form around the world, is to be able to enable the mapping of this information in different format in this common. And I believe that, for example, representing uh, this uh, implementation independent format like logical model and to provide, for example, concept map that allow you to define how to map different format into this common format would facilitate the uh, sharing of information from different sources. So we need to investigate if we need to invest also for developing this logical model, maybe some example concept map, but uh, it's a thing that we need to discuss together in the group. What I would like to invite is the people the people is to think about the next fire connected on and if and how we should uh, uh, create a fair uh, track there because it doesn't mean that we need to have a developer uh, it could be also a way to discuss and put, to put our hands on so I really would like to invite all the people to think about how we can maybe organize in next January that track and know with which scope and uh, how we would like to play with that uh, yeah. fairness by using fire. I, I see that there was another question that talked about, uh, about uh, the use of uh, DICOM and images. And I think this applies also to the, it's, it's the same question essentially to the GDF uh, uh, for, format question that there are so many formats around and we need a way to link that to essentially the fair principles. And then, like Oya said, make this accessible. I think for fair for health, uh, it's important to see what are the requirements and, and what is our roadmap towards a certification of health data sets, uh, taking into account all these activities and uh, making sure that the data formats are accessible and open so that people can read them. And at the same time, they protect the privacy 
uh, of the individuals uh, that are recorded in those data sets. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Are there any uh, final concluding comments from the panelists? Yeah, Alicia? Maybe, uh, yeah, uh, see, please. Uh, maybe, maybe I can. Actually, I'm not in this uh, field. I'm, uh, I use the uh, data, image data to do uh, some uh, applications. Uh, but uh, uh, I learned this uh, HL7 and uh, uh, fair for fire uh, uh, knowledge from this tutorial. It's a great talk. I uh, think I am, uh, uh, I'm into it. Is, Somewhat, maybe I want to learn more in, in the future. Yeah. Uh, from uh, in my, uh, I want to find the link between the, uh, let's see, HL7. It seems a kind of you know, communication channel or kind of uh, uh, level that will pass the, the data. It has the uh, standard and uh, fair, uh, fair data. Uh, fair is a kind of you know, uh, regularization, it actually uh, confines the uh, data's uh, nature, like a findable, re accessible, re reusable. And the fire seems it will be used. I, I don't know, uh, it, it is a kind of usable, become a usable uh, uh, outcome. So I don't know, my understanding is uh, correct or uh, there's a kind of uh, 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 still some, yes. Some uh, I think yeah. I think you are right. Yeah. Uh, we are actually bridging two communities: the data science community with the health interoperability and hospital information community. So there was one community that did research and open science, and another community that actually did care, health care. And the question is, how do you bridge those? And this uh, actually leads to a very pertinent last question that I think uh, we could answer, which is, says, uh, and, and maybe Alicia, as the uh, project uh, uh, coordinator, who you could uh, weigh into that at a high level, is uh, it says, uh, uh, how do we make sure that we don't violate uh, any EU privacy laws also, uh, in Fair for Health? Uh, we have two real-time, uh, real-world um, uh, case studies. How do we make sure that uh, EU privacy laws are respected in Fair for Health? Yeah, uh, in Fair for Health project, we are taking into account this kind of issues. Uh, uh, so uh, we have in the consortium a, a partner that is expert in, in this uh, kind of uh, topics about laws. Um, uh, I don't know if, if Oya uh, that is um, has more experience uh, about um, fair compliance. Maybe could add some details. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I can add in here, uh, there are different uh, like uh, there are lots of challenges around healthcare data to keep this privacy and compli comply with GDPR and also like ethical concerns. Fair data does not only support data sharing within a small consortia, but also like it supports distributed algorithms, sending algorithms, analyzing it distributedly. So I was, uh, I just passed a link from GoFair initiative. Uh, they are looking for how to work with this fair data without sharing the data itself and keeping this GDPR uh, privacy uh, and GDPR and privacy uh, regulations uh, intact. Uh, so uh, FAIR data uh, makes this kind of data-driven approaches possible. And also within that uh, uh, data premises without giving data out. Indeed. Thank you very much, Oya and Alicia. And if I may also mention to people, maybe they can listen back the recording, because uh, what uh, Mert uh, actually demonstrated is a privacy-presented uh, 
data mining algorithms, distributed data mining algorithms. And this was actually one of the questions. It's still something that is not well known to the wide uh, research community. But and, uh, I think one of our key messages, takeaway messages, is that we should do more of these tutorials so people understand that they can actually run algorithms of top of distributed data. They can, without actually sharing the data. So with that, I would like to thank all the attendees that uh, have stayed uh, until the end and uh, thank the panelists, the participants, and uh, we are really delighted that uh, you are with us uh, in this uh, uh, Bear for Health uh, RDA operation. And please join us uh, in, in our journey. Thank you. Okay, yeah, this is a very good talk. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, everybody uh, who is not in this field, this tutorial is uh, valuable and uh, instructive. Uh, thank you, everybody. And before we go, I want to uh, announce that uh, we have uh, another uh, tutorial today that we will do in, uh, let's see, in uh, about half hour, um, 24 minutes, 26 minutes. The topic is the healthcare innovation in the post-pandemic era. Uh, pandemic era, uh, era. So uh, welcome to join us later in different uh, link, linkage. I will, we will share the link uh, later. Or you can uh, uh, watch it uh, watch through the stream. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I want to yeah. inform. Oh. Thank you. Yes, let's talk about supply chain and innovation next. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great talk.